Hello, Matthew Bell with Alzheimer'sProof.com, and today I wanted to talk about and expand upon a subject that I've touched on in a couple of other places, both in written articles as well as in a couple of previous videos, and that is exercises that you can do, not for the body, we'll get into those in subsequent series, but for the mind. So starting in an article that I posted on Alzheimer'sProof.com and then subsequently in a video covering over some of the same territory, I went over 12 different exercises that you can do, 12 different things that you can do to keep your mind active. I'll list them presently. Those included board and card games, brain teasers, then I mentioned specifically checkers and chess. Crossword puzzles, of course, is the one that people think of when they think of this kind of thing. Language was number six, learning a language trying to develop some element of familiarity with another language, either in written or in spoken words. Music, picking up and learning a musical instrument. Maybe music appreciation could also fit into that, but mostly it was about learning a new instrument. Puzzles was number eight, like actually fitting together jigsaw puzzles. Reading nine, social interaction was ten. That's a big one, kind of surprised me that it was on there, but that is one of the major ones. Sudoku was number 11, and finally working is number 12, and that's just working at your regular job. For more information, I'll put, the, I'll put links in the description to my article, to the other video, and I recommend those to you if you're not incorporating one or multiple ones in your life then you could be missing out on an opportunity to exercise your brain. But I've also talked in other places, both again in a written article and in a video, about ways that you can enhance the effectiveness of your memory. Now, this might not be applicable to people who actually are currently having symptoms of Alzheimer's disease or some other form of dementia, but they can certainly be used by people who are trying to avoid that end. And I named four things in that particular discussion. Number one was don't over rely on memory aids. So we're so used to writing things down or using our smartphones or whatever, using Google to, to act as a surrogate for actually remembering things that we used to just remember ourselves. I mean, that could be a simple thing that's often brought up from phone numbers, but it's just general fact in type information that we no longer have at our disposal mentally, and we rely on these mechanical devices, and it's arguable that they might be reducing our ability to memorize anything or reducing our memory capacity. So a couple of specific tips on how to improve the memory were use the major system, number three, create mnemonics for yourself, and number four, create a mind palace or a mental palace. And again, I get into the specifics in those other places. But for the present time, I wanted to expand on that because in some cases, some of these things, like the major system, they require doing groundwork to actually learn the system and implement it. Same thing with the mind palace. I mean, it takes some work to get that palace erected, so to speak, to get that palace in place. Or again, with the 12 tips for previous exercises, you know, you actually have to have a board game. You actually have to get the Sudoku puzzles or the crossword puzzles. I mean, there's some physical things that go along with that. And so in this video, I wanted to concentrate on those mental exercises that you can actually do with no other, generally speaking, nothing else is required, just whatever is in your mind. And so there are certain things that you can do, certain exercises you can put your mind through, memorization techniques, alphabetization techniques, and those are interesting to me because, again, they can be done anywhere by anybody in terms of having set up. There's no need for a space or an opponent or a board game. In most cases, I'll, I'll, there's a couple of things that are kind of a fun little game that I include that also, that you know, you'd want to play with somebody else. But apart from that, a, a number of these things are things that people can just kind of inculcate into their life, incorporate into their life, and use them to exercise their brain. So let's get into it. Just a word on the difference between a manipulation and a memorization. So manipulation, the word manipulation actually comes from the Latin word mani, which is, has to do with the hand. So manipulation in the strictest sense is going to be something you do manually, which is another word in English that derives from the same Latin, from the same Latin root. And so when you think about the manipulation part of it, it's essentially going to be things like actually writing the alphabet backward or forward or actually spelling out the words by hand on paper. But a memorization is going to be one that you do without the aid of any kind of writing implements, no paper, no pens or pencils, just your brain. Once again, you can combine some of these, so alphabet, uh, alphabetization and memorization could be combined. You can make it harder by running things forward or backward, backward usually being harder or run it in reverse, spelling in reverse, alphabet in reverse, counting in reverse. All of these things tax the brain in a way that it isn't usually taxed. Once again, just as a reminder, as a, as a final summary statement, you know, as we go through these exercises and as you implement them, once again, you have to be aware of the stage of the person, 
whether they have Alzheimer's or cognitive impairment or not. So for example, for me, doing these exercises is going to have the purpose of trying, hopefully, to avoid any kind of manifestation of these impairments down the road. But if a person already has mild cognitive impairment, then obviously the point would be to try to avoid a more serious dementia developing. And if a person's in dementia or has Alzheimer's, a specific diagnosis, then that person's ambition presumably is going to be to try to preserve the memory function that's still there for as long as possible. In terms of kinesthetics, I'm going to get into in another series, there is a colleague of mine who is an expert on the physical aspect exercising, and she is going to provide different tips in terms of exercises that can be done. So I won't get into that here, but suffice it to say that there is a kinesthetic element that can be brought in as well. It can be very simple. I mean, it could be trying to balance on one leg as you're memorizing or reciting the alphabet. It could be jogging in place or marching. It could be doing jumping jacks. It could be a number of different simple kinesthetic movements that can be used. And there's a number of reasons for this. One reason you might think is that Physical exercise sometimes helps the brain in terms of retention and in terms of repetition and repeating things back, recall, but it also can simply be a matter of using the brain for multiple different functions at one time. I hesitate to call it multitasking. It is not really that, and it's arguable according to some articles that multitasking doesn't even exist. It's just your brain you know, shuffling between tasks very quickly and not actually doing both things at once. But nevertheless, it is possible to say balance on one leg and recite the alphabet backward. And so this kinesthetic element can also add a little bit, can add some variation, and it might also add a little bit of a boost, cognitively speaking, to some of these exercises. I'm going to break these exercises into two different categories. The first is cognitive only, and then we're going to include those exercises that have a combination of cognitive and kinesthetic aspects to them, if that makes sense, and hopefully it will as we go along. So the first thing in cognitive only that's going to be subdivided into two different categories, and that's going to be the alphabetical exercises and the numerical. So just start with the alphabet. Now bear in mind here, as we go along, that these exercises are going to depend on the stage, the stage the person's in in Alzheimer's disease. They're also going to depend on the application. I mean, are is this a an application to try to prevent Alzheimer's in the sense of, and please understand again, prevent here, I don't mean magically prevent or guaranteed to prevent or any of that, I just mean are we doing the exercises like me? If I'm doing the exercises, I don't, you know, knock on wood, I don't have mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's or anything. So when I do these exercises, I'm trying to bolster my brain strength, so to speak, to try to prevent it in the future. On the other hand, if somebody has mild cognitive impairment, maybe they're trying to prevent it from going into Alzheimer's. If somebody has early stage Alzheimer's, they're trying to preserve their memory function for as long as possible. So there are different applications, there are different people, there are going to be different also baselines. So for instance, you know, if somebody is coming from a particular skill level or understanding or whatever, you have to take their base level into account as well. So just starting with the alphabet here for the first set, obviously the first exercise is just doing the alphabet regularly in terms of your ABCs, just like a school child might, starting with A, moving forward, and stopping at Z. So green light is go, red light is stop. So start at A, end at Z, just like, again, a kindergartner would do. And for some people, this is going to be a challenge, at least for people. This is going to be a kind of a, one of the questions that you would expect on a kind of a mini mental status examination just to kind of gauge where the person's cognitive abilities are. And so if a person is far enough advanced in Alzheimer's, this might be a challenge. A little bit harder, obviously, to do the alphabet in reverse. Now let me point out another thing here, and that's going to be that there's a difference between manipulations and memorizations. In my lingo, the manipulations are going to be those things that you handwrite, and the memorizations are going to be those things that you just think through or speak out loud. So, you know, Z, Y, X, W, V, U, T, S, R, Q, P, O, N, M, L, K, J, I, H, G, F, E, D, C, B, A, alphabet backward. You can write it, but it's going to be harder to just memorize it and say it backwards. Now, the next category is going to be list memorization. And here, this could be anything. This could be your grocery items. This could be, you know, a list of your favorite movies, a list of the winners of 
you know, the last few Stanley Cup finals. I mean, this could be anything. Easy list memorization is going to be those things that are related in terms of there are themes surrounding the words. For example, bacon, coffee, eggs, muffins, pancakes. So if you're going to memorize that list, obviously those words revolve around the theme of breakfast items. Obviously, you can have other themes. So think about a theme like construction, brick, contractor, improvement, nail, roof. I'm just coming up with arbitrary words as an exercise. They could be meaningful in the sense that, let's say, let's say a person had their mom, dad, grandpa, grandma who was in the business of construction. So these words might be meaningful. They might be at least thematic so that they're easier to get a handle on. They might have, they might be a challenge. They might be something that's of interest. So I'm just coming up with word lists. There may be no practical purpose in memorizing these words. It's just an exercise or just like a shopping item a list, it might have a practical goal, namely to successfully retrieve those items from the grocery store. And, and again, these things have no, you don't need extra equipment for this. You could do this just in your own mind. And obviously I mean here by construction, I mean home construction. Now a medium difficulty list is going to be unrelated words. And you can kind of see here I'm starting with easy, medium, hard. I, you know, I'm not an education expert either. On top of the other things that I'm not an expert in, I'm not an expert on education or on anything that would give me, these are, you know, any kind of expertise in making the judgment as to whether or not these are easy, medium, hard. But intuitively, it makes sense that unrelated words are going to be harder to memorize than ones that revolve around a theme, because the theme is going to help you to get a handle on the words and help you to memorize them. So for example, unrelated words, I just come up with an example here, barren, duck, mattress, parachute, violin. As far as I can tell, these words have no real connections. At the same time, they are all concrete common nouns, so you can think of them that way. There is a connection there at a very kind of high level of generalization, but apart from that, there's really no other connection, and so these words are just arbitrarily strung together, going to be a little bit harder to memorize. Even harder than that are going to be words that are abstract. These could be words like anger, courage, love, villainy here. These could be words like that, adjectival kinds of words that pick out concepts or abstract ideas, but extra hard you might consider those words that are just particles in the English language or articles or prepositions, things that have really no, there's nothing mental, there's no image, there's no, nothing for you to, to really hang your hat on in terms of trying to get a fix on what the words are. So this kind of a list of words might be even harder to memorize. Now the next category of either manipulations or memorizations. And once again, if you write these, then they would be manipulations. If you memorize them only, they would be memorizations in my lingo. And I'm thinking of that as the memorization part would be harder than the manipulations. So in terms of alphabetization, easy would be to memorize names that are distant from one another. And I mean distant in terms of the letter combination. So for example, Anita, George, Nicole, Simon, Zachary, you know, we have a letter from the A then we have G moving forward, N is somewhere in the middle of the alphabet, S a little bit further along, and then Zachary, obviously, the last letter of the alphabet. So these are going to be easier to memorize than, for example, a medium difficulty list where they have adjacent initial letters like Luke, Mary, Nicholas, Owen, Peter. So L, M, N, O, P are adjacent letters, at least in my, again, I'm not a linguist here, but uh, it, they are adjacent letters, and so this kind of a list is going to be or a little bit harder to alphabetize here. One, and then here's a here's the thing. You could just give somebody the na the names orally. In other words, you don't write them down. You just say, let's say, Owen, Mary, Luke, Nicholas, Peter, and then the person has to both memorize the list and alphabetize it. That would be one. You could just give them the names, and they could manipulate the list, write it in alphabetical order. Memorization, adding memorization to it would make it all the more difficult. Another thing would be some of these lists are going to be, you're going to be able to have a kind of an easier and harder permutation depending on whether you run the alphabetization forward or backwards. So for example, Luke, Mary, Nicholas, Owen, Peter in alphabetical order, Peter, Owen, Nicholas, Mary, Luke, obviously in reverse alphabetical order. And if you are doing all that mentally, it makes it a little bit more challenging. A hard alphabetization would be where the names are proximate in the sense that the letter combinations are very close to one another. So for instance, look at these names here, Abigail, Addison, Agatha, Amanda, Andrea. These names are all in 
letter combinations that are very close to one another. And so they become more challenging because you're not dealing with alphabetizing the first letter, but you're dealing with alphabetizing the second letter. And obviously it would get even harder if you make it the third letter, if you make it the case that you are starting to alphabetize not just the first letter or the second letter, but if you start making word combinations where you would have to memorize and alphabetize up to three letters, four letters, it's going to be even more challenging. Extra hard, abstract. Again, instead of concrete, instead of proper names, maybe you do common names, maybe you do abstract nouns. Next manipulation, word length arrangement. So here, easy, easy one would be short words that increase in length. So obviously increasing in length is going to add difficulty, but it's going to be easy if each of the words has an obviously different length. So for instance, pot compared to anatomy, the word pot is three letters, anatomy is seven letters, so obviously pot is shorter than anatomy. So we have here, I just have a simple list, pot, fire, ghost, bucket, anatomy. Pot is three letters, fire is four, ghost is five, bucket is six, anatomy is seven. So it, it becomes, it's a little bit easier in terms of placing them in order when each of the words is obviously a different length than the others. Medium difficulty would be reversing that. So obviously anatomy, bucket, ghost, fire, pot, using the same words, reversing the, the word order. You can also add challenge by lengthening the words, and you can also add challenge by making certain words the same length so that they're going to be, they're, they're going to have to be placed together in the list. But here, for instance, puzzlement, hijacking, subjectivism, psychoanalyze, counterexample. Puzzlement is 10, hijacking, I guess, is 11, 12, 13, 14 letters. So from 10 letters to 14 letters, these are going to be obviously more challenging. Doing it in reverse would add another layer. So this kind of word exercise, it'd be something like that a person, I'm not saying I'd be able to successfully do it given my current ability to work through these, but, but this would be the kind of thing, obviously you're not going to give this to a person who's in the late middle stage of Alzheimer's disease, but you could potentially do it yourself. If you're a caretaker, work through these exercises yourself with the idea that it's going to help you to build up your cognitive reserve. We've talked about cognitive reserve in other places. I'll just kind of bring it in now. Cognitive reserve is kind of the idea that, you know, you can lift a little bit heavier than you need to. Like I use the example of a baseball player swinging two bats before he gets into the batter's box. He swings two bats on the idea that swinging two bats is going to prepare him for swinging one bat. He, if he can swing two bats, he can swing one. So if you can do these exercises, the idea is you're going to have farther to decline. It's just a theory, just a hypothesis, but that's the idea of cognitive reserve. Now, extra hard word length, again, would be to put them in reverse. The next set of manipulations is going to have to do with spelling. So easy ones, obviously, short words. So cat, C-A-T, dog, D-O-G, frog, pine, apple, house. You get the picture, just like, again, a school child. And a lot of these exercises are going to be similar to what children would do in terms of language acquisition. It's somewhat reversed, however. Obviously, if somebody has dementia, they are losing language ability. And so instead of children working from easy to hard, you might think of it as you're really, in terms of the stage of Alzheimer's, they're going to be going from harder to easy. Because as they advance, as the disease progresses, they're going to be able to complete fewer and fewer of these. But again, the hope is with these particular exercises is that you might build cognitive reserve, you might help to preserve mental function for longer than it would have lasted without doing these exercises. Medium difficulty, obviously longer words, helmet, grocery, poultry, mountain, scissors, just random assortments here. If you add memorization, once again on top of that, and once again, you can spell them forward you can spell them in reverse. That would even layer a challenge on top. So we can spell helmet, H-E-L-M-U-T. You can say, okay, how do you spell helmet in reverse? Well, T-U-M-L-E-H, right? But and then once again, it's going to be harder to do that memorizing it than it would be manipulating it. So if you see it written, it's going to be easy to just read it backwards or at least easier than memorizing. Hard words would be words that are just more challenging to spell. So presumably that's going to be ones that have odd letter combinations, maybe that create sounds that are more difficult to guess, or they're going to be just simply longer words. So establishment, mathematics, poltergeist, seismograph, topological. Now here's one I thought I would throw in for, for fun, and part of it is it's a tribute to my dad. My dad used to play this game with my sister and with me when we were all Usually it was in 
the swimming pool when I was a little kid. But uh, the initial game is what my dad called it. And it basically involves several different steps. It's a simple little game. First is you select a category. So for instance, maybe we say the category is movie stars. And then you specify initials of somebody who is a movie star. And you could do movie titles, you could do anything, but specify the initials. So let's say CB. Then the question is clues or questions. Namely, does the person who's providing the initial, so I am giving the initial CB, then I know who that initial refers to. I know whose initials those are. So the person guessing then would either get clues from me that I would volunteer or they would be permitted to question me. So let's say we chose to, cl to do clues. Well, if we chose to do clues, then I might say, okay, CB was female, and then she was called the it girl. And then that might trigger in somebody's mind, oh, that's Clara Bow. On the other hand, they might be permitted to ask questions. It's going to be very similar. They might ask, was she female or male? What movie did she star in? What genre was she known for? And so on. And then you'd ultimately arrive at whoever the initials are. In this case, of course, I had in mind Clara Bow. Now, the second set of manipulations is numerical. And so here we're just going to start. I'm going to start with just a block of numbers. We started before the basic building block was obviously the alphabet for the alphabetical manipulations. And this one is going to be the numbers. You could do 1 to 10, 1 to 100, 1 to 1,000. Presumably, this is also going to be a function of the stage and the purpose, as we previously discussed. And you can start. Obviously, one way of counting the numbers would simply be to move forward from 1 to 100, just like a, a school child would do to learn his or her numbers. But another way that would make it more challenging would simply be to count backward. So counting backward from 100, you know, literally by ones, 100, 99, 98, 97, 96, 95, and so on. You could also count backward by intervals. So for instance, let's say we counted backward by 10. So starting at 100, we would count backward by 10. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, if you want to count it on the, on the blocks. Or just know, obviously, 100 minus 10 is 90. So 100, 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. And finally, ending at zero. So once again, starting with just our number grid, you can again start at 100, and you can make it even more challenging by varying the interval, doing something that's a little bit less. So obviously, counting by ones is fairly intuitive. Counting by tens, counting by fives maybe might be a little easier. But how about counting by sevens? So 100, 93, 86, 79, 72, 65, 58, 51, 44, 37, 30, 23, 16, 9, 2, and so on. Now you can also do forward counting variations, so making it harder than just counting normally by 1 would be to count by intervals of whatever. So let's say we count by 6. Obviously, starting at 1 from 6, we would get to 7. From 7, we'd go to 13, 19, 25, 31, 37, 43, 49, 55, 61, 67, 73, 79, 85, 91, 97, and then that would conclude that. Now that's similar to something that is referred to as skip counting. So in skip counting, you know, we would generally, you know, you generally start with zero or whatever. Essentially, we're going to start with six. So if you skip count starting with six, you know, you just say six, 12, 18, 24, 30, 36, 42, 48, 54, 60, 66, 72, 78, 84, 90, 96. Skip counting by sixes. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, and so on. Skip counting, skip counting by fives, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, and so on. And th this is a challenge depending on, once again, stage, intellectual ability, cognitive function, what your baseline was, and what your goal is. Are you trying to avoid Alzheimer's? And right now, knock on wood, you have no cognitive impairment at all. Are you trying to slow down the advance? Of Alzheimer's, are you trying to what you know, trying to stop progression from mild cognitive impairment into some worse form of dementia? What's the goal? But if you found something of use in this video, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell to be alerted to new content as it becomes available. I remind you that I am trying to get together content for the physical exercises and for some of the other to expand on some of the other topics maybe that we touched on in this video. So you can look for that content if you're interested. I thank you so much for joining me today, and I look forward to seeing you again in another video. Thank you.